Episode 7 of the Dynasty, focusing on one of really the most ludicrous scandals in sports history, Deflategate. Tom Brady's once pristine character now being questioned, something that hit the quarterback quite hard. Welcome to our dynastic post show here on NBC Sports Boston. We've got Michael Hawley, we have Tom Curran, I'm Phil Perry. Guys, want to get your quick reaction to what you saw from the Deflategate episode. That's where we're going to start. We're talking episodes 7 and 8 Tonight, what did you think of episode seven, Tom? Really brought you back to a lot of the emotions that you felt in real time because, you know, in the post after that Deflategate game, after their dominant win over the Colts and the reporting that began, you said to yourself, this, it's the same old song and dance. And then by the time the Chris Mortensen tweet came out later in the week, I think we all kind of grabbed our pitchforks because we had no idea what two pounds of PSI meant. <laughs> right, right, right. Well, if 11 That's of the right. 12 balls are that That's deflated, right. two pounds, I, I'm like, I don't know, how two pounds. So, and then as it starts to move along, you start to realize, well, we got hoodwinked and we're being hoodwinked and put up to this by a league that is desirous of something happening because all the teams that had been steamrolled finally rose up and found that smoking gun that they thought. I, I remember it like yesterday. My, my oldest, who is now a, a, a ninth grader, was in kindergarten. And so I remember taking him to school the next day. The principal of the school says, hey, uh, what do you think of this, uh, this thing, this, this, is this football thing, this PSI? And I said, that's nothing. Because this is day one. I said, that's nothing. They won the game 45 to 7. You really think we're going to be talking about air pressure in footballs like it's a big deal? I just still can't believe, I didn't believe it then. He said, I told you. I didn't believe it then. I don't believe it now, Phil, that we spent so much time talking about PSI and the ideal gas law and all of these things. And it's, and it's the only time in football history that we've talked about it. Like, have you mentioned it? Have you thought about it in the last not five once. years? Never not once. And, and it's not just that. It's the elements that then started to circulate. I mean, I was at the Southern Court, Southern District Court in New York multiple times, having to break down paragraph 46, <laughs> having to write down notes because we couldn't have any recording devices and then call into our boss at the time, Art Martone, so we could write things up, sitting in the courtroom watching these things unfold and really being given... Uh, an introduction or at least a reminder of the power of a corporation when enough of its members, board members, say that that team's got to go. Right. What I found interesting was that this episode, they do a good job, the Dynasty people do a good job of showing just how absurd the entire thing was and reminding us of that over and over and over again. And yet showing us some, some really emotional moments that occur throughout, and you get to some fractures in relationships. But I do want to start back at the beginning, because one of the most fascinating quotes to me was early in Episode 7 with Adam Vinatieri, old friend Adam Vinatieri, saying, they were our biggest rival. They were the ones who were preventing us, us being the Colts, from getting to the Super Bowl every single year. We knew they had to be doing something. And that struck me as a yeah, former did. Patriot saying something like that, because that would necessarily, Adam remove some value from the three Super Bowls you won with the Patriots previously because this is only going to add to their reputation as cheaters. Michael, what would you think of that no, quote from Vinatieri it, early? It, that is coming from Vinatieri that, and we always forget, he spent more time with the Colts than he did with the Patriots. And at that point, he thinks that he is an Indianapolis Colt, and so he kind of takes on their, their anger and their grievances with the Patriots. And it's almost like smart people knew better but once they were outside of the, the Patriots' atmosphere, they, they started thinking like everybody else, and they were just frustrated. A, a lot of it was frustration. Sure, we got the deflator, uh, we got Dorito Dink, we got all this stuff that was not addressed uh, in, in, the, in the dynasty. But if you really just take a 30,000-foot view of it, you say, what are we talking about? Why are we, why, Tom, remember, you said, you know, the Southern District, how about... In the middle of summer, I think it was June or July, Tom Brady goes to the NFL offices and spends like 10 hours. Mm -hmm. He's like a deposition with the lawyers and Roger Goodell talking about Tom, uh, Roger saying, Tom, tell us again how you like the footballs. And he, they're all trying to set him up to kind of, ah, gotcha. It's weird. It, it was weird. And, and when you look at it, too, the Patriots were, whether it was Jeff Fisher and the Titans, whether it was... Uh, Ursay and Ryan Grigson with the Colts, whether it was John Harbaugh with the Ravens, whether it was the Steelers, they were blocking every team. And while they weren't winning Super Bowls until at the end of that season, 
they were continually there. And I think these teams said, look, they're not doing it above board. And that was all they could come up with. And, and it mattered because it was the Patriots. San Diego Chargers, I think they had a towel that they used to aid with gripping of the football. I mean, I know this stuff backwards and forwards. I can give you instances oh, yeah, after instances <laughs> that we know of other things having happened. They weren't looking for a murder weapon. They were looking for a crossed line on the highway to try and jail Tom Brady for... 10 years. And the further removed we get from it, the more absurd it seems. But at the time, everyone, everyone, the league, Tom Brady, the Patriots themselves, they took it seriously. Deflategate provided us with some of the most memorable sound bites in Patriots history. We have some here. Tom's personal preferences on his ball, footballs are some, something that he can talk about in much better detail uh, and information than I could possibly than I could possibly provide. Can you answer right now, is Tom Brady a cheater? <laughs> I don't believe so. I mean, I feel like I've always played within the rules. I would never do anything to break the rules. Um, and I believe in fair play and I respect the league. I'm not a scientist. I'm not an expert in footballs. I'm not an expert in football measurements. I'm just telling you what I know would not say that I'm Mona Lisa Vito of the football world. <laughs> we could keep so, going. You, oh, God, there are so many I there. My uh, faith to me, in the league. you yeah. just get in this ridiculous back and forth. You get some real examples of humanity being shown at the podium. Yep. I was in there for all these press conferences, whether it's Robert Kraft before training camp, much later where, you know, he's expressing real anger towards the NFL. Bill Belichick there, real defensiveness early and then almost cartoonish defensiveness with the Mona Lisa Vito press conference later, which they actually don't show in the docuseries. Tom Brady completely bewildered at the podium there, Tom. It was interesting to me the humanity that we saw from these guys and the emotion involved in all these press conferences, which we will never see again all over deflated football. Yeah, and by humanity, I, I'm not sure if you mean, hey, they were being nice to each other. I think in the nope. early days, it was, yeah. it's on him, it's on him, it's on him. Okay, you know what? No more it's on him. And Bill said, I'm going to fix this as best I can and speak on it. And it was a Saturday afternoon, the day before they were traveling to the Super Bowl, and we were told as we sat in the media room, Bill's going to come out and talk to you guys. And by then, all the national media had left. So it's me, Phil, Giardi, Mike Reese, I'm like, we got to ask everything. The whole country's going to be what? And we did. We asked everything. That's when you asked the great question. You said, hey, hey now, now, now that we got you here, Bill, uh, how about Spygate? And he goes, what did he say to you? It was a, it was a great line. Like 80,000 people. I mean, we're not the only ones who are doing it. So you got insight into that. But And then when they get to the Super Bowl, Robert Kraft turns it and says that we demand an apology. And then in May in San Francisco, he says, we're going to stand down. Then by the, it was unbelievable to watch. But what was so fascinating were the relationships, I think, behind that, because Bill did eventually stand in front of some of the slings and arrows that were coming at Tom, certainly. But also at the same time, this was a byproduct of, I think, of Bill saying to himself, this guy's a lot of friggin' work, man. Yeah, it can be and, a lot of friggin' work. And, and I like your line, Phil. You talk about the humanity of it because sometimes human nature, when you're under pressure and there's chaos, your first instinct is to protect yourself. And then, as Tom says, you come back and think of it later. Think, okay, what, what's the best thing to do? We're we still have to get to a Super Bowl and win this thing against a very good team uh, that had won it the year before in the Seattle Seahawks. So, humanity, first instinct. Robert Kraft is trying to protect relationships he has in the league. He's got a good relationship with the commissioner, but he's mad at the league. He wants to protect, protect the relationship he has with the commissioner. Bill Belichick, no, they got him with Spygate. And if this is on him, this is a real trouble for his career. And then Tom Brady hears Bill say this about ask our quarterbacks, and he starts thinking about the guy you drafted in the second round. Mm -hmm, exactly. Uh, in the spring, and Jimmy Garoppolo, oh, that's your boy. So how, what are you doing? I, 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 was, I had questions about you then uh, in, in the spring. Now I have questions about the way you're handling this. So I think there were a lot of emotions, a lot of undercurrents here that they finally were able to overcome and, oh, who knows, win a game, win well, a Super Bowl. And they had, you know, Darrell Revis there, which we saw a little bit earlier, talking about the emotional outpouring from Tom Brady 
in real time, bawling in front of his teammates, saying, I would never do anything like this. I'm curious in terms of the docuseries itself. They do ask Tom Brady, anything you'd like to say about the deflated footballs now that we're so many years removed from it? Because with the trip to the bathroom, which you detail so well, Tom, in, in the back and forth with the dynasty people, <laughs> the text messages about the deflator, like he had an opportunity there to, to say something about it, didn't add to it. Did that surprise you at all? It didn't surprise me when you look back at what the Brady family, I think, and you hear from Galen and Tom Brady Sr., Galen Brady, his mom, they really attribute in large part the illness that she was afflicted with soon thereafter mm. to so much of the stress that they incurred. Now, I'm not a doctor, but that is how they feel, what the Brady family went through in that. Now, I think Tom could... I think realistically we can look at this and say, well, they must have done something at some point. To the, there's too many text messages, too many circumstances. But I think Tom wouldn't want to revisit it in the fact that, look, I've staked out this position. I've gotten this far. I'm not going to say, well, I mean, they might have tried to get it back to 12.5. The bottom line is I think it was extremely painful. We all knew it was a jaywalking situation, and it got prosecuted like a felony. And I'll say quickly, uh, Tom Brady, when this happened, was 37. It was the first time, imagine this, the first time in his career that he had been criticized roundly and consistently mm -hmm. by the local and national media at 37 years old. Now, how many quarterbacks can say that? It got so absurd to the point, I wish they had included this, where Tom Brady Sr. calls into a talk radio station and says, you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Yeah, Roger Goodell is a liar. I mean, all of these things happen, and I think it changed, it changed Tom Brady. It's interesting, too. This gives you some insight into that. I talked, it's far enough down the road, talked to Mr. Brady after. He said, Tommy's mad. Tommy does not want me doing that because he's very concerned that he will be blackballed by the league if he continues to speak out wow. or we continue to speak out and he will never get a job in this league again. And, you know, we don't know where he's going to be right now with the Patriots, but he does not want to be blackballed. So Tom Brady saw mortality to his career. An incredible time in every sense of the word. we got much more coming up. Episode eight about the FU tour in 2016. <laughs> uh, coming up, we're diving into episode eight, which details just how hard it was for Tom Brady to play for Bill Belichick as well. Stick around. Check out the Patriots Talk podcast for much more on the Dynasty series. You can scan the QR code on the screen or find it on your favorite podcasting app or on YouTube. Episode 8 of the Dynasty focusing on that rocky relationship between Tom Brady and Bill Belichick. Matthew Slater checked in with some fascinating quotes throughout the episode saying at one point, quote, during that 2016 season, Tom was unbelievable. But Coach Belichick, being Coach Belichick, held Tom to an even higher standard than everyone else. Do I think Tom felt disrespected? Yeah, I think so. I don't think I would want to be treated differently, but I would want a certain level of respect, especially as a grown man. Then there was Wes Welker adding some color to the series here as well. He told Tom Brady, you know, Tom, he very easily could have been like, all right, Bill, screw you, man. Play somebody else week one. I personally talked to Tom and was like, you're basically like an abused dog. You just sit there, tail between your legs, and you just keep on coming back. So we're back here with Michael Hawley and Tom Curran. I felt as though those quotes, and especially from Matthew Slater, mm -hmm. who we know has had a good relationship as far as we know with Bill Belichick for a long time, to Fantastic. say some of those things. Not anymore. To me... Is, is almost boiling down into two or three sentences the real crux of the issue for Brady and Bill Belichick. If he felt like he wasn't being respected as a guy who had established himself as the greatest player of all time, that would cause a rift. Yeah, and that's what's hard is, you know, as we're reporting it, we are as individuals taking it through the filter of the people who might be involved or close to the people involved. And as a result, we don't have it from the horse's mouth on the record. There were plenty of instances where I was told whether it be Brady himself or Gronk, you know, this is tough. But hearing teammates who are otherwise very solidly hmm. Bill admirers and devotees say it was over the line is really instructive and, and helps to amplify that this is not a crusade against Bill. It is laying out this is how it was. It really worked well for a long time, 
But when Bill had had enough of Tom, he made life really hard for him. Tom, that's the issue. I mean, that really, you just said it. That's what it comes down to. Bill decided that it was enough. And it's, the irony is Bill, uh, as a coach, was always make, was mocking the, hey, do what they do franchises. Those coordinators, those head coaches, do what they do. Those who are not adaptable. He, you know, he made a lot of money you know, just dominating those guys. But yet, in this situation where he rightly planned for life after a 37-year-old quarterback, that's smart business. You got to plan for that guy. You don't know when that guy is going to uh, just, just implode. But when it was clear that it wasn't going to happen with Tom Brady, he refused to adjust, and he just made up his mind that Brady couldn't stay anymore, even though there was tremendous evidence to the contrary that Brady was at the top of his game. Bill wouldn't get off his original position, and that's where the conflict, that's where the uh, dysfun the tension, as Kraft pointed out, from tension to dysfunction happened. And it feels as though, Tom, given the up-to-date interview that we saw with Bill Belichick during this episode. He hasn't moved all that far off his spot. Now, we believe that Tom Brady and Bill Belichick are in a much better place now, mm -hmm. right? But at one point, at one point, he's asked about Brady's performance in that Super Bowl against the Atlanta Falcons. He says, well, Tom's performance is like anybody else's. It's a function of what's around him. You know, not many people could have done what Tom Brady could have done, especially at that point in his career. I would say as a viewer, yet yeah, nobody could have done what right. Tom no. Brady did at that point mind. in his career, and he is unbelievable, and that would be a good point to throw Tom Brady his flowers, and he chose not to. Yeah, I think they're at a point now where they understand each other, and I think that Brady is very much conciliatory. It says, as he said in the first episode, it was perfect. Why do we have to change it? Because there were going to be some eggs broken in making the beautiful omelet that was this dynasty. So I think they've moved past that, but in the real time of it, it was constantly Brady looking for approval and affection that wasn't forthcoming, which then got spun to, this guy's a diva, he wants everything. And finally, that's what led to the post-2016, once he's won his fifth Super Bowl, where Brady said, you know what? I keep doing it his way. I keep uh, my profile low. I don't worry about Tom. It's time to worry about Tom a little bit. And that's what happened after 2016. And he was the opposite of a diva, but you know, we talk about kids, it's like any other kid who's looking for approval. I'm doing the right things, and you still, you are, I'm doing the right things, but you're not saying the right things, parent. Okay, how do I get your attention? I won't do the right things in your eyes, and I'll turn it around, and, hey, hey, and maybe, maybe now you'll pay attention to what I'm doing, and that's what happened. Bill didn't respond, he never responded when Brady was doing everything. Brady, speaking to the team after, 2000, uh, after the 2007, uh, defeat to the Giants, first meeting of 2008, he stands there and he's crying. He's, you know, imploring the offensive line, uh, controlling the huddle. All these great quarterback traits that you want from a franchise quarterback gets no love from Bill Belichick. He, he doesn't get Bill Belichick's attention until, Tom, he doesn't show up uh, for OTAs. And now Bill really uh, has a hair across his and, and, and the relationship gets even worse. To me, I think one of the most interesting things about the Brady-Belichick relationship is the way in which Brady finally self-actualized. And I think it's also fair to look at this and say Bill built the team a certain way, but by 2015, 2014 even, 15, 16, 17, he now had on his hands a super team. And someone once said to me within the organization this year, Bill would rather take Navy and beat Notre Dame than take Notre Dame and win a national championship. Mm. That's kind of, and I, look, I have this overwhelming favorite. What do I do with this thing? I like it better when I'm just trying to outsmart people. Well, this episode does a great job of using the Jimmy Garoppolo draft pick. Again, another press conference we were there for. You're asking great questions, Bill Belichick after the fact, and framing that as how the psychology of this relationship evolved over time. And we've got a great quote from Robert Kraft discussing uh, Bill Belichick being prepared to move on from Brady as early as 2014. Quote, I think Bill thought Tommy was starting to lose it. I remember Bill used to show me different statistics. Tommy's throws over 20 yards were ranked near the lowest in the league. And Bill said, we have to be ready to move on. Tom, what I want to ask you is, do you feel as though Bill Belichick would have moved on had that Falcon Super Bowl not played out the way he did, or it did? The way it was playing out, yes. Hmm. When Tom Brady throws a pick, a pick six to uh, Jay Alford, I believe it was, 
Might be I have the wrong guy. Robert, Robert Alford. Robert. Robert. Jay Alford was 2007 Super Bowl. <laughs> One of the biggest <laughs> hits we've ever seen on Brady. Yeah. At that point, you have a hole that Tom Brady helped dig. If it goes on that way and they lose 41 to 10, and Jimmy Garoppolo's got an expiring contract, and Tom just pooped himself in the Super Bowl, and you have to now try and think how you're going to have Tom under the cap. I think it could have changed the entire arc of the organization. I think that Bill had his smoking gun to present to Robert. He did it in the Super Bowl now. It's not just 20 yards downfield or more than where he's weak. We watched it. And instead, you watched the greatest performance by a quarterback in Super Bowl history. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Uh, just quickly, yeah, uh, Brady w wasn't great with the pick six, but the defense was getting, the defense looked slow and was getting torched. That was kind of like uh, foreshadowing of what the problem was with the Patriots defense. They were not playing at the same speed as the Atlanta Falcons. But, of course, Bill, if you have an agenda that a guy has to go, you focus on that negative and not the, not the totality of it all. Do you disagree with that? Do you think that Brady, even he had had over a 12 game Oh, he was stretch. MVP of that season, and I, was, I believe. And I don't think Robert Kraft would have allowed it. I don't think he would have allowed he, it either. But I think he should have been MVP. Argument. But Matt Ryan Matt got Ryan it. Matt Ryan ended up yeah. winning it. Um, <laughs> we have to hit on what was maybe the the highlight of episodes seven and eight. This quote from Scott Pioli. You guys both know Scott Pioli yeah. really well. Uh, recalling the feeling in the room when the Falcons had that twenty-eight to three lead over the Patriots. And he says, quote, all the folks I'm working with, they're high-fiving. It's out of control. But I was a mess. I felt this nervousness. And as I'm sitting there, someone slaps me on the back and says, come on, Scott, lighten up. you got to enjoy this moment. And I just erupted. And I whipped around and I said, you effing people, you don't get it. <laughs> that guy number 12 across the field, he's pretty Good, effing Phil. Kruger. Yes, he's coming back. He's going to get a bunch of us. Yeah, Phil. <laughs> I just hope he doesn't get us all. <laughs> He's Did he actually say this is what I want to know because that is one of the most dramatic moments in NFL history in terms of the behind-the-scenes stuff that we don't get to see in real time. I'm going to say this. <laughs> Jeffrey Wright is nominated for an Oscar this weekend. Uh, Paul Giamatti, Scott Pioli <laughs> on a list, too. It's a great, dramatic retelling. I don't believe Scott said it exactly like that. Uh, no, Scott is right. He probably did erupt. And he said some things I can't say right here on NBC Sports Boston. <laughs> I don't know if they were as poetic as that, but I'm sure he did. In all seriousness, he knew. He, he has great respect for Brady. And at that time, he's an assistant GM of the Falcons. And he knows. Don't get comfortable around Brady. So I'm sure he told some people off, and it was uh, pretty uh, profane. You know, I, I think it's interesting, too, when we look at these two episodes. One focuses on... Uh, a controversy, uh, a witch hunt, and the fallout from that, but you don't see a lot of that incredible Super Bowl, which I think might have been the best ever in 2014. And then so much of this focuses on the Brady and Belichick and Garoppolo situation. I, I think this is, is, is where it's hard for Patriots fans who've seen America's Game and Do Your Job and, and everything else who probably watch this and say, well, this is, this is an Us Magazine, National Enquirer, headlines only situation. And I could see their gripe. Yeah, you know what, I would say the filmmakers never promised us uh, a step-by-step -step retelling of the dynasty. I wanted it, uh, but they didn't promise that. This is based on a book, and that's the key, based on, and I think they just went through the storylines. America enjoys it, Phil, maybe New England uh, wants a little bit more well, in the weeds football. Hopefully our viewers are enjoying this show. We've got one more next week. We're talking episodes 9 and 10. We'll see you here Friday, 6 o'clock.